Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to two different scriptures. We're going to start with Psalms chapter 139. And we are looking, starting at verse 11. And we're going to go through 14. And then we'll go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. So, let's read Psalms 139, verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the light, or even the night, shall be light about me. So, even when it's dark in your life, if you're walking with God, you're in the light. Verse 12, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So there is no darkness in God. It's all light. God is light, the New Testament says. And then verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. So from the time we were in the womb, before we were born, he has already covered us. He's there. Verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that my soul knoweth right well. So I want you to notice there's no darkness in God. God is light. And then I want you to notice that from the womb you have been covered. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made and you are marvelous I want you to say I am marvelous I am marvelous now say it like you really mean that I am marvelous I am marvelous now let's go to Philippians and let's go to chapter 4 in verse 13 I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So I'm covered from the womb. There's no darkness in God. It's all light. And I'm marvelous. He, I'm His handiwork. It is the job of the devil to tear down what God has raised up. And so it's the enemy's job to make you feel unworthy, inferior, insecure, and I just can't get there. Nobody likes me. I'm ugly. I don't have any friends. I wish I looked like them. I wish I had their money. I wish, you know, watching the congregation, I could say things right now, but I better let it lie because I've got to preach. Thank you, Father. You are good to us. Lord, help us to realize that you are light and that you have covered us and that we are marvelous and that you strengthen us so we can do the mission that you've given to us. 
I give you glory and honor now in Jesus' name. And somebody shout amen. amen. All right, bless you. You may be seated. I do not think that the biggest problem in the church is that we feel more highly of ourselves than we should. Now, you're always going to have those that conceited, prideful, arrogant, and such. But the big majority of people in our world feel insecure. They feel like they don't measure up. Some way, somehow, and that comes to us. And so when you're going to do a work for God, the enemy will always try to tell you, you don't know the word enough. Your testimony doesn't measure up. You're a nobody. Nobody cares. You're just out here on your own. But I want to talk to us about this. Every one of you have influence. Every one of you have influence. You influence family, friends. You influence people you don't even know. You influence people you don't even know. You influence them. And when we realize the power of influence, when we realize the power that is behind us, it has impact. When you can step up and mean it, when you say, I can make a difference. I will make a difference. I am making a difference. I made a difference. Now, it may be small. It may be big. But let us not compare ourselves among ourselves. That's not wise. Compare yourself to what you could have been. And our strength is in Jesus Christ. So what I want to start with tonight is we've got to start with ourself. So I've got to start with myself. When I was a child, they taught us J-O-Y. And the way you have joy is J is for Jesus, O is for others, and Y is for yourself. Now, I've used this so many times, many of you are already going in your mind. You know exactly what I'm going to do with it. And so we come and we say, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. You put Jesus first, then you go help others, and then you work on yourself last. But I've learned that if you do that, you do not have the influence. You do not have the impact. You do not do what you could have done for Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus first. But then you better work on yourself. Because a lot of people, they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe they can make a difference. They don't believe they can have the influence or the impact. And so they, they're intimidated. They're inhibited. They draw back. And instead of saying, I can, they hide and say, I can't. Or they say, let someone else do it. Or I will just be quiet. That's why I'm saying we've got to start with ourselves. If you don't believe in God, and then if you don't believe in yourself, how is anybody else going to believe in you? You've got to have confidence in God.
And then you've got to have confidence in yourself. Then you can do something for God. But when you're intimidated, you're inhibited, you feel like others can do a better job, you feel like others, and, and so why do it? You've got to realize if God put you there, God will empower you. Talking with somebody today, I told them the watchword is prepare. You've got to prepare yourself. You've got to be ready. The Bible says study to show yourself approved. You've got to prepare. Somebody shout prepare. So we've got to start with ourselves. We've got to make sure I'm a winner. How do we do that? Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he's going to give this other. He'll add this other to you. So we put God first. And then we say, okay, God, you are going to empower me. I can do all things through Christ. I'm putting God first. You're going to add to me. I'm putting God first. The enemy's on the run, and he is fleeing, and I'm going to have the victory. Amen. Hallelujah. You've got to start with yourself. Somebody shout, I can. Say, I can. I can. Say, yes, I can. Yes, I, can. I can. So it's not that you are prideful. It's not that you are selfish. No, that's not what I'm talking about. In a relationship, in a marriage, in a business relationship, friends relationship, family relationship, you are not being prideful and arrogant and selfish. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about believing in yourself as you trust God. You put God first. You submit to God. In fact, the first moments of the day, the first minutes of my day, I spend talking to Him. I want to talk to Him. I want to be in his word. I want to talk to him. Let him talk to me. And I am trusting him. And then I'm asking him to empower me to go through this day. To show me. To guide me. To be with me. And that's what we're saying. Hallelujah. So I want you to start with yourself. Again, say, I can do all things through Christ because he is my strength with him there is no darkness so if I find myself in darkness I need to go turn the light on I need to go to Jesus you got to turn your faith on you don't listen to doubt you don't listen to unbelief you don't listen to the gossip you trust God you walk with God. You're not following your flesh. You're not following your feelings. You're letting faith lead the way. Not feelings, but faith. Somebody shout faith. That's why you've got to start with yourself. If you're going to have influence, if you're going to have the impact, you've got to, as you trust God, believe in yourself. I'm not worried about people feeling uh, arrogant and prideful. There's enough wet blankets to bring that down. There's enough pins around to pop our balloons. There's enough. I I'm wanting to build people up. People are intimidated to pray out loud. I was in a prayer meeting this week. 
I was teaching leadership in a church, and, and before the leadership meeting, they had a prayer meeting. And so there was probably 70 to 80 people in that prayer meeting, and they're praying, and it was very quiet, and the pastor come in, and he said, oh, Brother Foster, I can't stand this. They're quiet. I said, dude, I've walked around. They're praying. He said, if I'm not hearing them, then they're not praying. And I said, are you God? <laughs> but you've got to be bold. You've got to believe. So start with yourself. I can do all things. I am a child of God. I will not let life or my flesh or other people put me in a corner. I'm going to prepare. I want to trust. That's why I'm working right now. I want to bring teaching to this church to where we will know what we believe. And it's going to be in our next steps program. And we need to know that. So if we are questioned, we can just spit it out. This past Monday night, I was teaching a leadership meeting in a church in Houston. And an airlines pilot come up to me after church. And he said, man, I like you. He said, what's the difference in this church... And he called the name of another church. He said, what's the difference? I said, well, you've been coming here and you've been going there. You tell me what the difference is. He said, man, there's something in here. There's something. You can feel it. There's something about this. And we got to be able to tell. So I went into some descriptions and talked. And he goes, Wow, I've been studying on that. But you've got to believe that you can. Well, we don't have to be intimidated. We don't have to be inhibited. We step out. Now, my second thing is simply this. We've got to be happy. I'm looking. I have met a lot of unhappy people in the church. Their doubts, their unbeliefs, their frustrations, their anxieties, their inability to get along and for whatever reason. But we've got to be happy. And Paul said, I think myself happy. So what we have to do is eliminate our negative emotions. How do you get rid of that? Here's how you do it. You understand what it means to be happy. Roses are red. Violets are blue. My disposition does not depend on you. If you're going to have your happiness depend on how people treat you, how people talk about you, you're in for problems. Because guess what? Not everybody's going to get along with you. And so it used to be that if we could just get rid of depression and stress and anxiety, then we can be happy. But I want to tell you, you're going to have stress. You're going to have tension. You're going to have pressure. And if you're looking to live a life that doesn't have stress and doesn't have tension and there is no pressure and nothing that would 
want you to be depressed and that sort of thing. What you've got to do, you're going to have trouble. Things are going to come. You're going to have losses. You're going to have struggles. You're going to have problems. You're going to be down. But what you've got to do is understand where happiness comes from. There's more to health than just not being sick. How many people you know are not sick, but they're not healthy? They're not sick, but they're not healthy. They're not happy. Emotional health, health is more than the absence of dysfunctional emotions. So what we have got to do is make up in our mind, I'm going to get right with God. And whatever comes my way, I'm walking with Him. I'm trusting Him. I'm believing in Him. Greater is He that's in me than he that's in the world. And so I will have pressures. I will have stress. Things are not always going to go my way. Somebody may crash into my car. I may have a horse that has COPD. I didn't know there could be such a thing, but I got one. She's going back to the doctor this week. And he's going to give her some more shots. And I've prayed for her. I don't know why, but she gets better at the doctor. <laughs> Come on, somebody. But I'm not going to get distressed. I'm not going to get eat up with woe is me. And if somebody doesn't sing my song and somebody doesn't, I'm going to love God anyhow. Amen. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm going to think myself happy. I'm going to, I'm not waiting on you to make me happy. If she burns the toast. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be okay. But I have to keep checking myself. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. You know what I've started doing? <coughs> I was driving my truck, and I was hungry. And I wanted something sweet. And this was last week. She had gone to Louisiana to pick her mama up. So I knew she wouldn't be home. And I'm just driving, and I had the thought, you know, I haven't had Krispy Kreme donuts in a while. She's not home. And then my spiritual side said, you better not. And my flesh side said, oh, but wouldn't they taste good? And the spiritual side said, you better leave it alone. And the carnal side said, oh, that light's going to be on. And they're going to be hot. <laughs> and you know what that tastes like. And next thing I know, I look over there. You know, I had to drive out of my way just to see if that light was on. And that light was on. And the next thing I knew, that truck had a mind of its own. And I'm trying to fight that steering wheel. You don't, and it just turned, it overwhelmed me. And next thing I knew, I'm driving away and I got half a dozen of original glazed Krispy Kreme donuts. And I said, Nope, I'm not going to eat them. I'm going to take them. I'm going to go home. Uh, she left me some 
spaghetti and I'm going to eat that. And then I'm going to take my time tonight. And she's not coming back till tomorrow. And, oh, it's going to be so good. And they're sitting right there in that box. Right there on the bar. Right beside where I'm sitting. And lo and behold. I heard that back door open up. And I knew Hayden was working. One of Dallas' finest. He was on patrol. So I knew it wasn't him. And I'm wondering, well, who is that just walking in my door? The door opened and the dogs ran in, but no one come in. So I got up and I walked. I left them laying right there. Mind you, I haven't had a bite of one of them. And I walk out and lo and behold, there's my wife. And she's brought her mama back a day early. Oh, how are you? Good to see you. And I'm not even thinking about what's laying on the bar. And she comes in and, oh, she's in a hurry and she's got this and that. And then she's back out getting her mama, helping her into that uh, motorized wheelchair. And she's back in and I come in and I look and it's right there in front of God and everybody. My sin. Krispy Kreme donuts. And I haven't got one bite of them yet. And I go, why did she come home? Oh, she's ruined it. And she said, what did you say? Oh, baby, I'm so glad you're here. Forgive me, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> and I swept them up when she was in the... And I couldn't believe it. God shielded her eyes. And she didn't see them. So I'm thinking, where could I put them? Where could I put them? Okay, I'm not going to go in the bedroom. I'm not going to go in the closet because that's where she goes. So where could I put them? Where could I put them? Where, 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 where? I went and hid them down in the den by the bookshelves. And I put six of them in there. And I said, when she goes to sleep tonight, I'm going to get up and come get me some donuts. And now, the next day was Friday, and I was flying out, and I had to leave early. Boy, my phone is dinging. Y'all are texting me right now. And so I... <laughs> she better not be... <laughs> He says she's watching live. Oh, Lord, I'm not about to go look. <laughs> she's driving home from Louisiana. She better not be watching while she's driving. <laughs> so I fell asleep that night, and I, I didn't wake up. Till morning, I got up. I forgot about it. I got ready. And off to the airport I go, and I'm on the airplane flying to Tampa, Florida, where I was going to speak that night and Saturday, and it dawned on me. I didn't do anything about the donuts. All right, God, it's you and me. Now, I'm going to make a deal with you, Lord. If you will not let her... So I got home Saturday night, and she was outside with her mama. I made a beeline for over there by that bookshelf where I had them stashed, and there all six of them were. Now, they've been there since Thursday, and this is Saturday night. I pull them out. I make sure no one's looking. Boy, this is so much like sin. No one's looking. I opened it up. I took one out. I ate it. It's been there over two days now. 
Oh, it was good. It wasn't hot. It wasn't as good as it could have been. And uh, I thought, okay, I can't leave it here. I, I, I can't go out and throw it away because she's there. So I got to stash it. So I found me another hiding place. And I'm not going to tell you where it is just in case she's watching. Because that was Saturday night and I forgot about it. And I got to church Sunday morning and I had to leave right after church, go to the airport. Because I was preaching in Houston Sunday night, Monday night. And so I didn't think about it again till Tuesday on the way home. And now I didn't think about it again till I got up here. I wasn't even going to use this. And I got to thinking about it's still there. <laughs> now I'm not wanting to eat them. I'm just wanting to destroy them before she finds out. And I'm pressing my luck. Why am I even telling this story? Because I'm talking about you got to be happy. So I bought six Krispy Kremes. I ate one. It wasn't as good as I thought it would be. But I'm, I'm not going to let it get me down. Now, if she's watching, that'll be a whole different story. Because I'm going to blame it on y'all. Oh, the church made me do it. Oh, y'all aren't having any of that. All right, the devil made me do it. We've got to think ourselves happy. And Krispy Kreme is not going to make you happy. Because it has left a bitter taste in my mouth. After I ate it, I went, you know what? I, I just come in from the airport, and I went looking for it. She's outside with the mom. I said, I haven't kissed her yet. And I ate that sugar. Boy, my, I'm going to have to turn this phone off. It's dinging like crazy up here. Who's texting me? She is. Who said that? So I went and I brushed my teeth three times trying to get that taste out of my mouth. That sweet, syrupy, crispy cream. And when she kissed me, she didn't say, oh, you've been eating sugar. So she's either going to know by watching this and I don't, I don't think she is. I'll find out. <laughs> or if one of you go squeals on me. <laughs> and if y'all squeal on me, you're going to be in trouble. Because I'm going to pray that a thousand camel fleas will inflict your under armpit. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I don't need her to know. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. She walked by me, was it last week or two weeks ago, and she poked me in the belly, and she said, Santa Claus is coming early. <laughs> she said, that suit coat's getting a little tight. No, it's not. <sighs> Lord, I'm, I'm in trouble. Okay, let me move to my next point. You can't give what you don't have. Dana, quit texting me. What we have to do is realize we will never go 
or we'll never get anybody to go any further than what we have gone ourselves. So if we want others to go with us, we've got to go. Harry Firestone said this, you get the best out of others when you give the best of yourself. But if the best you have isn't any better than what those others already possess, you'll never get them to go any further. That's why I've got to be better. That's why I'm preaching myself under conviction with the Krispy Kreme donut story. Or at least I think I am. So we have got to make up in our mind, we as a church, if we're going to impact our world, then we've got to be right with God. You start with yourself. You've got to be happy because you can't give what you don't have. So you've got to make up in your mind that my influence is going to be good and not bad. That I am going to be healthy in my influence. Why? Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a child of God. I got royal blood. I mean, my father owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. If heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool, that's my daddy. That's my father. So I'm trusting in him. I can be better than what I am. So I'm trusting in him. I'm believing in him. Quit beating yourself up and saying, I'm a nobody. I can't make it. I can't get there. What you've got to do is prepare and start with yourself. I'm going to put God first, and then I'm going to believe in myself. And as I trust God, I'm trusting myself. I am preparing myself. Now I can go and help other people. I'm just being open and honest with you. When I first came to pastor, I had never pastored before. I was a kid. I was only 28 years old. I was intimidated. But I said, I'm not in over my head. Because I'm going to prepare. I'm going to get ready. It's just like the Englishman that climbed Mount Everest. His first time up, he failed. But he looked at Everest and said, you can't get any bigger, but I can. And I'm going to learn. And I'm going to get better. And on his next trip, he and Tenzing, they got there. And in the 50s, they conquered Everest. It was tough. Now, how many do it every year? In fact, they say so many people are climbing Everest every year that there is trash on the mountain that's frozen in place. And there it is. Old tents. Junk. They've garbage. They've thrown out and such. And every so often they try to go back and clean it up. But a lot of it is frozen. It's in the ice. There's no thawing. And so there it is. Everest couldn't get any bigger. But he did. This is what you need to be looking at your life. And saying you can't get any better. But I can. I'm going to study to show myself approved. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God made me. There's no darkness in him. And so my, if it's dark here, I'm going to go turn the light on. How fast does darkness flee? As fast as the speed of light. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. That quick. 
And so when you turn Jesus on to your problem, there's light. There's victory. So look at it. You got a problem in your marriage? Bring it to Jesus. Now you got to keep coming. If it didn't happen today, you keep coming back. You keep believing. You keep expecting. And if there's problems in, in relationships, you got then just keep coming. If, if it's in your health, keep believing. Keep preparing. Do what the doctor says. Go along. There's nothing wrong with that. Am I, am, am, am I making sense? Come on. Hallelujah. Now, don't pass up every gas station on the highway. And then when that little light comes on, and you go, oh God, oh God, oh God, help me right now. Lord, Lord, help me. Oh Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh God, do it again. You turn water into wine. God, put gas in this gas tank right now. I'm believing you right now, right now. What about all the gas stations you passed up? Hello? If you got out of bed this morning and you didn't make the bed up, don't ask God to go make the bed up. Okay, God, I need a miracle. I need the bed made. No, there's some things you just got to do yourself. But you've got to prepare. You've got to be ready. You've got to put it in there saying, God, I am going to be there. See, it all comes down to one thing, and that one thing is how much value are you? What kind of value do you have? How do you value yourself? Are you valuable? If you keep saying, oh, I'm nothing. Oh, I could never do that. Oh, I'm not. You're valuable to somebody. And you better start with yourself. God is in me. God is for me. God is with me. And so I am going to look at my value. Hallelujah. Man, does anybody have any folding money on them? I had some, but I had to give it away before I got here. All right, here he comes, right here. Just, I don't know. Okay. All right, here's two $20 bills. Does anybody want this? Boy, you're trusting me, aren't you? Here's two $20 bills. If I gave them to you, would you take them? Would they spend? Okay, well, let's look at it. Okay, I folded it up like that. What, do, do you want it? What, would it spend? Or your wife's back there saying. <laughs> what, would it spend? Y'all talk back to me. All right, what if I do this? Now, that was a nice $20 bill he brought up here. I mean, it was crisp. But look here. There it is. Anybody want it? Would it still spin? All right, now let's look at it. It's not that crisp dollar bill. I'm trying to do this without tearing your money. Now it's all wrinkled up. Is it, is it still valuable? You still want it? So you can fold it up. You can wad it up. What if I just do this? It's all wadded up. Boy, look at that. That's flat. You still want it? Does it still have value? How come you don't treat yourself like you treat that $20 bill? You get folded up by life. You get 
all wadded up, pressed down by life. You get stepped on. You get ridiculed. You get put down. Do you still value yourself? Oh, yeah. Come on. Boy, he said this. She said that. Well, they do. Well, I'm just... You got to be like this $20 bill. Thank you, sir. I'm giving them back to you. It's still valuable. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, you have value. You have value. You have been stepped on. You've been pushed down in the carpet. You've been beat up. You've been slapped. You've been folded up. You're all wrinkled up. I, Life has not been easy, but you still have value. You're still a child of God. You still have royal blood flowing in your veins. So what you've got to do is make up in your mind, I can make it. I've got it. I have value. I'm not worthless. I'm not insignificant. Hello? Just because you don't have the money of Trump or you don't have the money of Obama or you don't have the... It's all right. You still value to God. Come on, somebody. What has life done to you? I'm a child of God. I got royal... You got to accept that value. You got to walk in it. Have you ever heard anybody say, she has issues? He has issues. You know what they're saying? What they're saying is they're stuck. They can't get past it. And all of us have those kind of insecurities. All of us have those pressures and those problems. Maybe you're not as tall as you wish you were. Maybe you're not bulked up like the Hulk. Maybe you don't have the good looks that somebody else has. You don't have the figure. You don't have... Well, quit comparing yourself with others. I'm a child of God. I got royal blood. I'm going to quit putting myself down. I'm going to quit letting others determine my disposition. Remember, roses are red, violence are blue. My disposition does not depend on you. So I've got to accept my value. I've got to accept myself where I am. Quit getting hung up on your hang-ups. Quit wishing you were dealt a better hand. The word acceptance comes from the Latin word. Now, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. But it means to take to oneself. In other words, you've got to accept yourself. Accept yourself. So you got to believe it. So do I have any winners here tonight? Do I have any winners? Yes, I'm a child of God. He created me. He made me. I'm marvelous in the sight of God. So I'm going to believe. But I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to study to show myself approved. I'm going to be ready. I can do all things through Christ. I will be positive. I'm not going to beat myself up. Put myself down. How many single people do I talk to? And well, I'm just nobody. Well, I can't get nobody. Well, well, with that kind of attitude, you never will. And then I talk to married couples. And well, why did I get stuck with him? I said, that's on you. Huh? Or why did I get stuck with her? That's on you. I've, I've had kids tell me, well, I wish I had their parents. But why do I have these parents? 
I remember when I was a 19-year-old kid trying to help other kids. And they, they told me, well, I, didn't, I don't have parents like your parents. And I said, well, you've got the same father I do. And they go, I don't know what you're talking And I said, no, in Jesus Christ, we're all of the same family. So you got to get your mind off what you don't have. you got to get your mind off all this It's telling you you're insignificant. You're a nobody. you got to shout, I'm a somebody because I belong to Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to quit talking myself down and I'm going to talk myself up and I'm going to walk in the light. Somebody shout yes. yes. Say, I can do it. So increase your value. So once you recognize and accept your value, now you belong to Jesus Christ. Now, how do you increase your value? Start solving your problems. Easy as that. Solve your problems. Quit crying about them. Quit belly aching about them. Quit griping about them and solve it. Oh, well, I can't solve it. I don't have the know-how. Well, that right there, you never will. But when you go to God and you say, Lord, help me now. Woo, something starts happening. When you say, okay, God, show me, direct me. Now watch this. He may not bring it right then, but he will. Because sometimes we need to go through the struggle to prove to ourselves, I can make it. Come on now. Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. You know, I was talking to somebody today. I tried to talk about my twin brother every day of my life. And so I was talking to him about my twin, and somehow it came up about my sickness that I went through in 2010, the colon cancer. And I told them the way I got through that was I couldn't do it myself. God was going to have to help me, and my doctors were going to help me, but I was going to believe, and I'm going to be all right. And it, it's going, God, you're not through with me. We're going to make it. And wow, I mean, Dr. Carrizales, they got me all that go juice that first night at the hospital. And next thing I knew, my pain was gone. And I'm all right. <laughs> and I'm just kind of floating around. What are y'all talking about? And they're talking about what all they're going to do. But down deep inside, I was thinking, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to make it. There was convalescent time. I probably came back quicker than I should have and had some complications. That was on me. But here, but here I am. It's been eight and a half years. I'm still going. I'm still ticking. Come on, somebody. How many times that old slew foot would come back? I'd have a little pain. Oh, I'm hurting. I remember I was on trail ride. Brother Shambo, you were there. And y'all had to take me to the emergency room. And uh, I, I thought I was having the same old pains all over again. Boy, here it is. I can't believe it. Now it, it's come back on me. And I, all night long. And, and so the next day, I said, I'm not going to the hospital. And they fooled me. We got in the truck to go saddle the horses. And... They took me to the hospital instead of, and next thing I know, I'm walking in. And so we spent the day there and come out, I was having muscle spasms. So a lot of times when the enemy's trying to tell you, you got this coming back on you, it's just a muscle spasm. And God's there with you. Come on, somebody. Tell that devil he's a liar. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to make it. I'm going to be there. Come on, you struggle with it. You got to make up in your mind. Maybe you struggle with a hairline temper. Don't raise your hand if you do. Anybody here have that kind of temper? 
Don't raise your hand. Boy, you just get mad real quick. Well, what you've got to do is start setting boundaries. And then you say, God, help me, convict me, warn me, speak to me when I'm getting close to that boundary. And God will do that. He will do it. I've asked God. I said, God, you've got to help me. Now, when I'm getting to that point, you stop me. You should. And he will. He will. Maybe you're lazy. Well, you need to set boundaries. Okay, I'm not going to waste time doing this, that, or whatever until I've accomplished X amount today. And so then you set that up, and then you set that boundary. Am, am I making sense? In all this while, you're adding value to your life. Hello? This is how you overcome. And so you pray, and you read the Bible, and you look in the Bible to find Scripture that's going to back it up. I'm amazed at how many people say I'm a child of God, but they never spend time in the Word of God. Oh, y'all getting quiet on me now. Come on now. We all have those hurdles that we have to o overcome. In my reading, I found that 55% of Americans feel like they have things they need to overcome. Maybe it's a bad habit. The truth is, you can change. You can overcome that bad habit. You can increase your value. You can make it. You just got to make up in your mind, I can do it. You've all heard the illustration of the elephant, where they take a baby elephant, and they put a chain around his leg, and then they secure that chain into the earth. And that little baby elephant will pull and pull and pull and can't get loose until finally he just gives in. And he just stops. And years later, it's a big bull elephant. A couple of tons. It's huge. And they just put a chain around his foot. And then just tap that stake into the ground, put the chain to it. The elephant could pull it up if he wanted to. But he doesn't. Because in his mind... He believes I can't do that. I went back and read this book by James Belalasco. It's called Teaching the Elephants to Dance. And it told me that story and how elephants would not do that. Their conditioning limits their movement. And so even if the stake was pulled up, it wouldn't even be in the ground the elephant would still stand there. And so how many people are like those powerful elephants? Just because your conditioning has put you there, you're a nobody. You'll never make it. You can't do it. You might as well quit. You might as well give up. And so we just mindlessly accept the restraints on our talents and ability. And we can't do it. But you know how they teach elephants to dance? They go to the same elephant. And they remove the chain. And then they start leading them. And before long, the elephant, as soon as that chain is removed, he's ready to go. We need to remove the chains from our life. We need to remove those things that hold us back. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now, Sister Megan and the Yates, they're going to foreign countries, and they're going for several months. They got to raise the money, and their flesh, and, you know, getting close, and where's the money coming from, and how's that going to happen? Hang on. Work. Believe. Prepare yourself, but watch what God's going to do. I'm telling somebody in here right now, you can make it. 
I watched Sister Megan in Austria. One night I listened to her teach, and I sat in there, and she knew I was there. And boy, she, man, she got after it. She was stomping her feet. She was waving her arms. She was walking around. I went, mm, that's one of mine right there. Wes, you would have been proud of her. And so the next night, instead of letting her know I was there, I hung out behind the door where she thought I was gone. But I was there. And I watched her and listened. And Boy, that girl got with it. Come on, somebody. I'm telling somebody here right now. God has given you a call for some type of ministry, and you don't think you can do it, and you, you've been told it'll never happen. I want to tell you right now, you better start believing God. You better start believing. Some of you have the ability to pastor. Some of you have the ability to lead other people in the walk with God. Come on, you can teach Bible studies. Your businesses. You can do it. Somebody shout yes. yes. Come on. Some of you can write songs. Some of you can write lessons. Some of you preach. Wow. Here we go. You have influence. Man, I got to land this thing. So now you got to believe in yourself. So, somebody shout yes. yes. Say, I got to believe it. Have you ever heard the story, and I'm closing, of Chuck Wepner? Chuck Wepner was a boxer. And he just believed that if he put his head in the path of the other guy's fist, over time, he would wear that guy down and he could beat him. Doesn't sound too smart. But it worked for him. And he went along until finally he got signed to fight Chuck Foreman for the heavyweight championship of the world. But along the way, Muhammad Ali, the greatest, beat Chuck Foreman. And so now Chuck Webner realized, I've got to fight Muhammad Ali. Wow. So he said, I'm going to win. And he told his wife, I'm going to win tonight. I'm going to beat him. And with 19 seconds left in the fight, Muhammad Ali beat him with a technical knockout. But right before that, that big old ham-sized fist had hit Muhammad Ali right in the chest Knocked him flat on his back. And Chuck Webner is right close to the end of the fight. He goes back to his corner and he turns to his corner man. And he says, you better crank up the car. Because we're getting ready to leave here as heavyweight champion. And his corner man said, I'm looking over your shoulder. And you better turn around. Because he's getting up. And Muhammad Ali got up in the next few seconds. He won the fight. But that's not where the story ends. I looked this up. And there was a struggling writer that was watching that fight. And as he watched the fight, it suddenly dawned on him. And he said, that's my story. And so he started writing a story. And it took him several days. He wouldn't go, get up. He didn't go outside. He stayed right there writing the story. And he won the Academy Award for the movie Rocky. And Sylvester Stallone 
made his mind up watching that fight. That's my story. And so he took Chuck Webner's story and he put it into all of those Rocky movies. Sylvester Stallone, instead of the $400,000 payday for his script, he said, no, I'll just take the minimum wage of $340 a week, but I'm playing the title role. And so he did. The studio had to call Chuck Webner and offer him a deal because the story was based on his life. They said, we'll give you a flat fee of $70,000 or 1% of the movie's gross profits. Wepner said, I want the guaranteed $70,000. That decision ultimately cost him $8 million. But that's how a lot of us are. We sell ourselves short. We don't believe that we have anything of value ourselves. We don't think we can do it. We, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you're the greatest asset you have outside of Jesus Christ. You, what you say, what you do, you can if you will wake up Get up, quit being lazy, quit sitting back, and stay with it. Look what Sylvester Stallone did in the carnal side of life. He was a nobody. He didn't have anything. And he saw it, and he accepted just $340 a week. But he's saying, I'm going to make, I'll make millions. And he's made millions. And the Rockies turned into other movies. What, Rambo? And each one of them were several, and they led to other contracts. And what happened to Chuck Webner? Poor old Chuck. He become a liquor salesman. And that's what happened to him. Didn't make hardly anything. I'm here to tell you, you better start believing in God and believe in yourself. Somebody shout, I believe God and I believe in myself. Well, you got to love God, you got to love yourself, and you've got to love others. Now, you're not being prideful and arrogant and stuck up. No, you're believing in yourself. How many times have you heard me say, I love you, but I believe in you? Come on. Wife, you need to tell your husband, I love you, but I believe in you. Husband, you need to tell your wife, I love you, but I believe in you. You need to tell your children, I love you, and I believe in you. Come on, you need to look in the mirror. Hey, I love God, but I believe in you. You can do great things. You can be somebody. You can be successful. You can be blessed by God because I can do all things through Christ whom strengtheneth me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works of God. You say, but preacher, I'm on the backside of nowhere. You don't, have, it's not a sin to be on the backside of nowhere. It's a sin to stay there. What you've got to do is roll up your sleeves and say, I can. Yeah. Woo! Somebody shout, yeah. yeah. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Father, I come to you right now. I am so grateful that you are our great benefactor. Lord, you took the cross and you've showed us the way that if we will pick up our cross and follow you and walk after you and trust you and believe that you are in us, making us, Lord, we can do what you have called us to do. 
Bless this church right now in Jesus' name. What kind of mission has God called you to do? What kind of mission has, what kind of vision has God given you? You got to believe it. You got to expect it. You got to be able to reveal it to yourself so God then can use that to reveal it to the world. Hallelujah. Somebody shout yes. I believe there's a day coming when this church is going to be full up. But it's not going to happen until we start believing it. Hello? So I've been writing. And I'm going to get that book published. And I'm going to sell it everywhere. You know what I want to do? I want to start turning out some videos. Hello? And then start sending it around. You know what I want? I talked to James today. He brought me an idea. He said, we need to bring our praise team and record some of our own songs we wrote and start sending it out. <laughs> Who knows where it'll go? Hallelujah. Oprah got started somewhere. You know, at one time, she was just a little old country girl that went to the big city with an idea. Boy, I've lost some of you right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do y'all understand what I'm trying to say tonight? I don't want us to sell ourselves short. That's why I want you to go out and talk and invite anybody and everybody to church. Friend Day is coming on June the 3rd. That is only three Sundays away. This Sunday, we are honoring police, EMTs, and firefighters. Let's stop by a substation and tell them about it. Invite them out. Wow, let's do something. Hello? And this is going to be a special one. Because my son is now a Dallas police officer. One of Dallas' finest. Now watch this. Just the way it all turns out, he's working Sunday. He won't be able to be here. But he's working but friend, that doesn't mean that I'm going to sit back and say, well, we can't do this. We've got to do it when he can be here. We're going to honor police officers. His picture's going up on the screen. Hallelujah. He's standing back there right now getting all embarrassed because I'm talking about him. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. So let's bring people to church. Let's talk about it. Talk about how great God is. All right, I'm, man, I, I got, thank you, Lord. Bless our people here right now in Jesus' name. God bless you. I'm going to be down here at the front. Elders and ministers are going to be here. If you want prayer, come on, we'll be here. God, go with God. God bless you. See you Sunday. Bring people with you. Let's have a great time in Jesus'